All right, welcome back. Chapter 17, Cardiovascular Emergencies. Our overview is going to be the review of the circulatory system, anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology, cardiac compromise and acute coronary syndrome, nitroglycerin, age-related variations, pediatrics and geriatrics, and assessment and care. Assessment and care, general guidelines, and summary. Okay, your case study. EMTs Ella Bray and Lisa Mullins are caring for Bart Frey, a 62-year-old man with a history of angina. Mr. Frey experienced an onset of heavy pressure in the center of his chest, radiating to his left shoulder, and accompanied by profuse sweating. Ella's general impression is of an alert but anxious patient who appears pale and diaphoretic, and whose facial expression indicates distress. What is the underlying process that leads to angina? Is the patient's presentation consistent with angina, or do you suspect something else? What additional information do Ella and Lisa need as they begin patient care? Again, I encourage you to pause this video and write these questions down so that you can answer them as we go along. Okay, heart disease is America's number one killer. Heart disease can lead to chest discomfort or cardiac arrest. Because of the potential consequences, EMTs treat all patients with signs and symptoms of cardiac compromise as a cardiac emergency. Alright, circulatory system. It has three major components, the heart, blood vessels, and blood. You may see that on a test question. The conduction system generates electrical impulses that stimulate contraction of muscle cells. Pacemaker sites are the sinatral node, the atrioventricular node, and the Purkinje fibers. Uh, you'll always hear that the sinatral node is the pacemaker of the heart. Okay, here's the conduction system. You see the superior and inferior vena cavas, the aorta, Right there you see the sinatral node, the pacemaker, gives off that electrical impulse down through um, the heart muscles, through the right atrium to the atrioventricular node, and over to the left ventricle. And from the atrioventricular node, they go down the Perkins, excuse me, the uh, right and left branches of the bundle of his, which is going to be right here, the bundle of his, and then the right and left branches. And then that branches out into the Purkinje fibers, and which cause the right ventricle and left ventricle to contract. So look at this picture. Know the system and know what, what makes it work. So that if you see it on a test, or if you ever have to deal with a patient with an, a uh, dysrhythmia, which is not a normal heart rhythm, then you'll kind of understand what's going on in the heart. All right. The conduction system, the heart has the property of automaticity, but heart rate can be influenced by the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Automaticity means you do not have to tell your heart to beat. It's going to beat. Okay, the heart pumps blood through the body. The left ventricle must overcome the pressure in the aorta to eject blood. Excessive pressure in the aorta over time can lead to heart failure with pulmonary edema. Now here's the heart and this is uh, labeled and also gives you how the blood flows through the heart. Again, I, I cannot stress enough, cannot stress enough how you need to know this diagram and everything on it. It's very, very important. Very, very important. Please study it. Circulation of blood through the cardiovascular system. So we have the air entering the lungs, going down to the alveoli where gas exchanges in the lung capillaries here and here. And so what happens is the heart, the blood comes, the deoxygenated blood and waste comes back to the heart in the right atrium, then the right ventricle, and then it is pumped to the lungs. 
through the pulmonary arteries and then it picks up oxygen now it becomes oxygenated blood blood at the lung capillaries and it's pumped back to the left ventricle through the pulmonary veins okay there's a left and right pulmonary artery and there's a left and right pulmonary vein so from the left atrium it goes through the bicuspid valve to the left ventricle where it is pumped into the aorta this big huge artery right here and from the aorta there's branches that go into the coronary arteries to give the heart its oxygenated blood then also um, up here you see where there's some branches where it goes to our our um, carotid arteries and our brachial arteries and then you see the aorta go down like this behind the heart so it goes back down uh, in front of the spinal cord spinal column excuse me and pumps blood to the lower extremities and throughout the rest of the body so it's a very complex system but you need to know how it works the main thing is you got to understand that blood needs oxygen to deliver to the cells and it has to pick it up somewhere and that will be in the alveoli in the lungs okay vessels Vessels consist of arteries, the bigger um, blood vessels, arterioles are a little bit smaller. Then there's the capillaries. Capillaries contain ar arterial um, oxygenated and deoxygenated uh, capillaries because that's where gas exchange happens. Then you have venules, which are a little bit smaller than veins, and then veins, which carry blood back to the heart from the body. And here we go, some major arteries. Please look at this. Excuse me, please look at this diagram and know where you, so your major arteries are. You need to know the carotid arteries. You need to know the brachial arteries, the aorta, the femoral arteries, the radial artery, and the ulna artery, and then the popliteal artery. So, uh, parent, oh, excuse me, the uh, perineal artery, uh, the posterior and anterior tibial artery, because you're going to be checking pulses down here, the pedal pulses and behind the knee and all that stuff. So. Uh, you need to know where those arteries are because you can tell if somebody has a, a arterial bleed and it's bright red spurting blood then you can kind of tell what artery that is major veins now these veins are carrying blood back to the heart um and if they are if they get severed or they rupture there can still be mass hemorrhage okay it just might not be as fast as an arterial bleed but they, they can definitely bleed out um, if um, the, the bleed is not taken care of. And, um, you know, we always talk about the jugular vein, but you can see how big these veins are, okay? Big veins, and they, they're carrying blood up to the heart, and then up this way, and then back down through the neck, okay, to the heart. The vessels, the heart muscle, is profuse by the coronary arteries. Occlusion of the coronary arteries deprives the muscles of oxygen. The heart, uh, heart attack, heart failure, and abnormal cardiac rhythms may occur. So here's a diagram of the coronary arteries. Um, you see the right and the left coronary artery, and then um, the anterior uh, descending branch. And there's veins bringing it back so that because it's going to deliver oxygenated blood to the cells the cells are going to give off the waste and the carbon dioxide it needs to go back to the heart all right the blood it consists of red blood cells white blood cells platelets and serum platelets play a role in cardiac emergencies through their role in blood clotting you need platelets for your blood to clot. Platelets, thrombin, and fibrin are components of clots. A thrombus may form at the site of a plaque uh, in, in, in a coronary artery. So plaque buildup, which is just um, cholesterol, fatty foods, that sort of thing. Plaque buildup in the coronary arteries. Um, the thrombin and fibrin and platelets will collect and attach to that plaque in that coronary artery and cause a thrombus. So a thrombus 
uh, is a blockage. Um, you need to know that because you will see it on a, on a test. Um, it'll also, if you ever hear about a patient getting thrombolytics, uh, thrombolytic drugs, those are clot busters, clot buster drugs, thrombolytics. Okay, the process of arter artery occlusion. Uh, that word in parentheses is atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis, say it five times real fast. Okay, so if we look at the figure, we see A, the endothelium or the inner wall of the artery is damaged as a result of smoking, diabetes, heart, high blood pressure, high blood cholesterol, or other causes. Um, we see that uh, in figure B, fatty streaks begin to form in the damaged vessel walls. C, fibrous plaque forms causing future vessel damage and progressive resistance to blood flow. And indeed, the plaque deposits begin to ulcerate and rupture, and platelets aggregate and adhere to the surface of the ruptured plaque, forming clots that may nearly or totally block the artery. And that is where we're going to get our chest pain and our cardiac arrests. Cardiac contraction, electrical impulses is generated in the SA node, the sinatral node, and travel first to the atria causing atrial contraction, then to the ventricles, causing ventricular contraction or systole. The electrocardiogram, or ECG, uh, is a graphic representation of the heart's electrical activity. Uh, electrical activity includes depolarization and repolarization. The electrical activity is detected on the skin surface by electrodes. So when we teach you how to put on a 4 lead and a 12 lead, this is what you're going to be doing it for, for the electrocardiogram. And this is an EK, EKG tracing of normal sinus rhythm. So you, uh, this is, you'll, you've all seen this little line going across, and you've seen EKG strips, and some people get them tattooed on their arm and all that good stuff, and that's cool. But uh, if you're going to do it the right way, make sure you get a tattoo that looks like that, and not some weird-looking rhythm. All right, so um, you have the P wave. It's pointing to the P wave. Corresponds to the contraction of the atria. And then the QRS complex. So if we see right here is the P wave QRS complex is this big spike right here. The QRS complex correlates to ventricle contraction. So atria contracts, ventricle contracts. And then we have the T wave, it represents um, preparation for the next series of complexes. So the heart's getting prepared for the next, what? P wave, okay? And there you go. Uh, hypoxia or damage to the electrical conduction system can cause improper function of the heart. Uncoordinated firing of the ventricular impulses can lead to PVCs, uh, ventricular tachycardia, or ventricular fibrillation. Ventricular fibrillation, or V-fib, is what we call it sometimes, um, is where we're going to, the, the AED is going to note a shockable rhythm and try to deliver a shock to correct that uh, irregular heartbeat. Blood pressure. Systolic blood pressure is measured during contraction of the heart. Diastolic blood pressure is measured during relaxation of the heart. The degree of resistance of blood vessels affects blood pressure. Now, I've already taught you how to take a manual blood pressure, so um, here's a little bit better understanding of what you're what you're actually doing. Um, in inadequate circulation results in hypoperfusion or shock. So perfusion is the blood, uh, oxygenated blood, full of nutrients and everything that go around to the cells throughout our body, and delivering off those nutrients and oxygen to our cells, and then the cells say, "Here's our waste and carbon dioxide," and it takes it back to the lungs to be expelled and that is perfusion so that's what needs to be happening in our body at all times hypo perfusion hypo rem remember rhymes with low so low perfusion is a bad thing and that can be um caused by uh hemorrhage or uh, just depends on uh it can be caused by shock where the body shunts all the blood back to the core um and you're going to get um pale cool clammy diaphoretic skin that sort of thing so, um, and we'll talk about more of that in the next chapter, but 
Um, inadequate cir circulation also deprives cells of oxygen, nutrients, and waste removal. Um, it may result from hypovolemia, which is a low blood volume, heart failure, or vasodilation. Anytime we say the word vaso, we mean blood vessels and dilation. If you ever had your eyes dilated before at the, at the eye doctor, you know, you, you know what it means to have dilated pupils. Well, blood vessels do the same thing, and they also constrict like pupils as well. Okay, cardiac compromise and acute cardiac uh, coronary syndrome. Cardiac-related emergencies are a significant problem. EMS plays a role in reducing the death rate associated with heart attacks. Time is critical. Early recognition is key to effective treatment. Collectively, cardiac conditions are referred to as cardiac compromise. The sooner the patient receives treatment, the better the prognosis. Anytime you have somebody dealing with chest pains, I don't care if you know for sure that it's angina, which is not a heart attack. I don't care if you know it's angina. I, I, don't, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. It's going to be treated as cardiac compromise, and we're going to treat it as a cardiac emergency, and we're going to get them to the hospital, okay? Because there are tests that we can run and machines we can put them on to tell us if, in fact, um, and if they, you know, our EKGs could tell us also if they're having an MI, but um, we want to take them to the cath lab because they want to know what percentage of the heart's blocked, what percentage of the heart is dead, or what part of the heart is dead, so they can uh, try to fix it. So we can't do that in the field. So don't don't think you know what's going on. Just don't make an assumption like that. Um, I can't tell you I can't tell you enough. If it's somebody with chest pains, treat them as a cardiac emergency and get them to the hospital. Arteriosclerosis or atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is an inflammatory disease that affects the arteries. The inflammatory process may eventually lead to the development of a thrombus and occlusion of the vessel. Occlusion means a blockage. Okay, it's occluded, cannot pass. Um, atherosclerosis of the coronary vessels is called coronary artery disease or CAD. So if you see CAD, uh, abbreviated again, it's going to mean cardi coronary artery disease. Coronary artery disease. Acute coronary syndrome um, includes unstable angina and myocardial infarction. If you have, if you haven't figured out what myocardial infarction is or an MI, it is a heart attack. Um, narrowed arteries lead to myocardial ischemia, which is um, myocardial. We're talking about the heart. Ischemia. We're talking about death of the tissue. Um, the typical response to myocardial ischemia, ischemia is chest discomfort. All right, angina pectoris results from reduced oxygen delivered to the myocardium, the heart, results in chest discomfort, usually occurs during physical or emotional stress, generally relieved with rest and nitroglycerin. So, atherosclerotic plaque formation in the coronary arteries results in ischemia, distal to the blockage which causes angina or chest pains so we see that blown up uh, portion of the coronary artery we see the atherosclerosis built up in there and uh, which causes plaque and that, like i said the more the, the more of that the, the worse that condition gets uh, atherosclerosis the, the the more likely the platelets and the thrombin and the fibrin are going to collect and uh, cause a blockage so that blockage, if you see the blockage is here, then it can result in ischemia, okay, which is the death of that heart muscle, that tissue right there. Okay, angina pectoris, when angina discomfort is prolonged and worsening or occurs without exertion, it is called unstable angina. That means nothing relieves it, you know, rest, nitroglycerin, calming down on that stuff oxygen doesn't relieve it so then you're going to have unstable angina women diabetics and the elderly may not have a typical presentation of angina discomfort is more diffuse or does not occur so um those those people that fit in that category may not may be having angina but might not know it the patient may complain of shortness of breath fainting weakness or lightheadedness remember Angina is oxygen deprived, and um, it, the heart muscle is, be, is being deprived of oxygen, causing that um, discomfort. 
All right. One second. Okay. Emergency medical care for angina. Manage airway and breathing. Supplement total oxygen at 2 to 4 liters per minute if the SpO2 is less than 94%. Assist the patient with nitroglycerin if their systolic blood pressure is greater than 90 millimeters of mercury. So right here, I'm going to pause you. The medicine has changed since this uh, PowerPoint's been written. We're going to assist a patient with nitroglycerin if their systolic blood pressure is greater than 100 millimeters of mercury. Um, and I'm just going to be honest with you, nitroglycerin drops the blood pressure. So if they're like 100, 110, I'm going to be leery about giving them more than one dose because we don't want to drop the blood pressure too low. If protocol allow, administer 160 to 325 milligrams of aspirin. That's also changed. It's going to be 162 to 324 milligrams of aspirin. Acute myocardial infarction typically occurs when a plaque ruptures and the thrombus forms within 20 to 30 minutes of inadequate perfusion. Heart muscles begin to die. Ischemia may lead to dysrhythmias, which is an abnormal heart, ry heart rhythm, and sudden cardiac death. Get that thing to go next. All right. Treatments are available to restore myocardial uh, perfusion. Success of treatments is time dependent. Diabetics, the elderly, and women may complain only of shortness of breath, nausea, lightheadedness, or weakness. Okay, here we go. Both myocardial infarction and, and less serious angina can present symptoms of severe chest pain. Treat all cases of chest pain as cardiac emergencies. So if we look to the left, we see angina pectoris. Um, location of discomfort, substernal or across the chest. Um, myocardial infarction is the same. Uh, you can look at this and compare angina pectoris, pectoris to a heart attack. And, um, and you can look, some of it's the same, um, some of it's different, but it gives you the location, radiation, uh, like which way, where does it go? The neck, jaws, arms, back, shoulders. So, um, you know, some people say, well, I'm having chest pains and it's going through my neck or my jaw or my, or my shoulder. Um, well, I'm having a heart attack. Well, possibly, but you could have possibly just be having angina pectoris as well. So that's why we say we don't know. So that's why we have to take, um, take precaution and treat it as a, a, a treat it as a, treat it as a cardiac emergency and get them to the hospital. All right, acute myocardial infarction, emergency medical care. Have the AED available in case they uh, go into cardiac arrest. Manage the airway and breathing. Administer oxygen. It doesn't see, it doesn't tell you about an SpO2. Just administer oxygen because oxygen is going to help, especially if they have um, that ischemia. Okay. Administer 162 to 324 milligrams of aspirin. Notify the receiving facility early that, hey, we're coming with a cardiac emergency so that they can have their team ready. Request ALS if available. Okay, back to the case study. L obtains a history from Mr. Frey as Lisa conducts a focused physical exam and takes baseline vitals. Mr. Frey's discomfort came on 20 minutes ago while he was riding a stationary bike, but it was not relieved with rest or after taking a nitroglycerin tablet. He rates the discomfort a 7 on a scale from 1 to 10 and says, the sensation is worse than he normally has with angina. His vital signs are a pulse of 80, strong and regular, blood pressure 132 over 84, respirations at 16, and SpO2 is at 99% on room air. 
What treatment should be implemented for this patient? What additional information will be helpful for the receiving hospital to know? Again, I encourage you to pause and write these questions down so you can answer them in the future. Okay, aortic aneurysm or dissection. Uh, very, very touchy subject here. Um, very, very difficult to deal with. It's almost impossible to deal with. But an aortic aneurysm is a weakened area of the aortic wall it is, uh, that dilates and it kind of makes a balloon out to the side of the aortic wall. Um, it, rupture may occur with rapid fatal internal bleeding. If, if someone has an, an, an aortic aneurysm and they know it, so they're, they've been to the doctor and they've been diagnosed, um, the doctor is giving them specific instructions on what to do and what not to do so that it doesn't rupture. Because some doctors won't, won't touch them, won't do surgery on them until they get bigger for whatever reason. Um, but if those things rupture, um, if you look at the aorta and it's coming out of the top of the heart, down behind it, going down through the stomach, or excuse me, the abdominal region, and um, it's a huge, huge artery, and it's really close to the heart, right, especially right there, and uh, before it branches off into the uh, pelvic region. But if it ruptures, man, there's going to be such a great amount of blood loss that your patient has minutes, 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 minutes. And if you're dealing with somebody who has an aortic aneurysm and you palpate their abdomen, and you feel a warm pulsating uh, mass, and you need to leave it alone. And you need to carefully, carefully, carefully get them on the on the stretcher, carefully get them in the truck, and carefully get them to the hospital, because you do not want that thing to rupture, because it's going to be internal bleeding, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. Nothing. It has to be fixed by surgery. All right. I'm sorry. That's it's a very. It sounds very. Uh, much like demise, but it, it really is. And I had a friend with an aortic aneurysm, and thankfully it, it got to the size that it needed to get to, and they, they had surgery and they corrected it, but uh, it's just a tough thing, man. It's just really tough, you know. Um, so you just need to be careful, you know. And, and most patients know if they got one. If they don't, they find out when it ruptures, sadly, but it's true. And there we go. An aortic aneurysm leads to aortic rupture. Lots of blood flow, man. Lots of blood flow. We can see the aneurysm here, okay? And when that thing balloons out, it, it gets weaker, okay? So it's already pushed past all these layers, and it's weakened that wall, okay? So just any kind of bump, straining, anything like that, blood pressure goes up, and just heart rate goes up, just very, very detrimental, very, very detrimental. Aortic dissection, uh, the blood enters a tear in the inner lining of the aortic aorta and separates the layers of the aortic wall. Um, it often occurs in the thoracic region, so pain is severe, sharp, tearing in nature, often experienced in the back flank or arm. And that's what it looks like. So there's the aorta, and we see the different layers, and then there's a tear right here. And now the blood's still flowing, but it's also going into this tear. So what do you think is going to happen after a while? This is going to balloon out and become an aneurysm. Okay, so, um, and this is going to cause pain. It's going to cause a tearing pain. So if they tell you they got a tearing pain across their chest, it is possible they have aortic dissection. Not that you're going to diagnose it, but in your mind, you're going to be thinking that, okay? Um, emergency medical care conditions require immediate surgery. Do not administer aspirin because we don't want to make the blood thinner. Well, not thinner, but we don't want to make it slick, slick, slick. We want it to be able to clot. We want the blood to be able to clot. So if we give it aspirin, it's, it's going to reduce the clotting factory. Okay, the factor, not factory. Okay, in females, acute coronary syndrome often occur, occurs at an older age than in males with twice the likelihood of death. Classical findings are dull, substernal chest pain or discomfort, respiratory distress, and nausea, vomiting, and diaphoresis. Non-classical findings, neck ache, pressure in the chest, pains in back, breast, upper abdomen, tingling in fingers, unexplained fatigue or weight gain, and insomnia. The dangers of administering too much oxygen in acute coronary syndrome. Too much oxygen can increase cell damage in certain situations. The return of oxygen to ischemic tissue increases free radical production. 
give oxygen only when the SpO2 is less than 94%. Heart failure occurs when the ventricle can't adequately eject blood. It may be caused by a heart attack, heart valve problems, hypertension, pulmonary embolism, cardiac um, rhythm disturbances, and some drugs. Heart failure, the left, ventric uh, left ventricular failure reduces blood flow and perfusion throughout the body. Blood backs up behind the left atrium, increasing pressure in the pulmonary veins. Pulmonary capillaries leak fluid, resulting in pulmonary edema and impaired gas exchange. Okay, so on the left we see, uh, or this is ventricular, left ventricular hypertrophy, uh, or trophy, however some people pronounce it. Um, normal cardiac output, normal blood pressure we see here. And then we look over to the right side and we see decreased cardiac output with decreased blood flow, blood pressure, excuse me because that left ventricle um, is experiencing ventricular hypertrophy, okay? And we see it right here. So there's this reduced space. See the difference? Okay. Uh, right ventricular failure may be caused by failure of the left ventricle or COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, signs include peripheral edema, meaning uh, like swelling in the ankles. Jugular vein distension, you'll see that jugular vein um, blown out, like really big in the neck. Enlarged liver. Uh, cardiogenic shock can occur with left or right ventricular failure. Findings in right and left heart failure. So we look at the systolic blood pressure on pure right heart failure. This is low to normal. Pure left heart failure, normal to high. Breath sounds, clear sounds. Uh, on a pure right heart failure and pure left heart failures, inspiratory, inspiratory rails. Um, peripheral edema on the pure right heart failure, you'll see JVD and peripheral edema. On left heart failure, you'll see no JVD or peripheral edema. Signs and symptoms of congestive heart failure. So we look at this um, chart here. I don't know why they got this lady sitting here, I guess. Um, this is their cartoon version of CHF. Uh, mild to severe confusion, cyanosis, tachypnea, may cough up pink sputum, uh, nor low to normal or high blood pressure, rapid heart rate, a desire to sit upright, anxiety, distended neck veins, late in CHF, crackles, shortness of breath, or which is dyspnea, um, pale, cool, clammy skin, abdominal distension, uh, swollen abdomen, uh, pedal and lower extremity uh, edema, so foot and lower extremity, and there you go. There are some classic signs of congestive heart failure, swelling in those legs, and there is jugular vein distension. It's a late sign of CHF, but see that jugular vein all blown out right there? That's not normal. Mercy medical care for heart failure. Treat as for an acute myocardial infarction. Uh, or AMI, positive pressure ventilation may be required. Supplemental oxygen, according to 2010 AHA guidelines, uh, consider the need for CPAP to get, especially if it's got any fluid in the lungs, we need CPAP to push that fluid out. Um, hypertension associated with emergency conditions. Systolic blood pressure is greater than 160 millimeters of mercury and or diastolic blood pressure of less of greater than 94. That's a pretty high blood pressure. It's really high. In assessment, consider the patient's usual blood pressure. So ask them what's normal for them. You know, if they say, well, I'll take medication and it's normally like 130 over 84. Okay. So that's normal. That's definitely not normal compared to what's normal for them. Cardiac arrest. The heart is pumping inadequately or not at all and no pulse can be felt. May be caused by acute coronary syndrome or other causes. Nitroglycerin. You're going to love to hate this drug. It is a potent vasodilator that increases coronary blood flow and reduces the workload of the heart. EMTs may assist a patient with nitroglycerin tablets or spray. It is going to, that, that tablet or spray is going to have to be their prescription. Um, paramedics can give nitro um, without a prescription. EMTs cannot give nitro without a prescription. 
that 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 tablet or spray needs to belong to the patient and issued by a doctor. I'm sorry to make you feel less of importance, but that is your scope of practice. Okay, systolic blood pressure must remain, and we're going to say greater than 100, greater than 100, or no more than 30 millimeters of mercury less than the baseline to administer nitroglycerin. We're looking for a systolic of 100 or better, okay? We, um, you don't get that. You don't check vitals. It's going to be bad. Nitroglycerin must be given to patients who have taken a drug for, excuse me, must not be given to patients who have taken a drug for erectile dysfunction within 24 hours and longer for some drugs. So, yes, we must ask all of our patients before we give them nitroglycerin if they've been treated for erectile dysfunction. It's an embarrassing question, but you better do it. Because if not, then it can cause, you'd have to know what ED drugs uh, do so that you understand why you should not give nitroglycerin. Okay. Do not administer if the heart rate is less than 50, or greater than 100, up to three doses total may be administered in three to five minute intervals if pain is, isn't relieved. Three doses. Three doses. I'm going to say it again. Three doses. All right, click on the condition that would make a patient with chest discomfort ineligible to receive nitroglycerin. Uh, let's see. If you chose Viagra. Uh, actually, you know what? Wrong. If you chose systolic blood pressure of 88 millimeters of mercury, then you are correct because that blood pressure is lower. It says 90. Like I said, these this PowerPoint is old. Older than the, the medicine changed for nitroglycerin. Um, so um, we're going with 100. So a systolic blood pressure of less than 100 is contraindication to receiving nitroglycerin. Okay. Assisting the patient with prescribed nitroglycerin. Had the patient sit or lie down. Assess the blood pressure. Systolic blood pressure must be greater than 100 millimeters of mercury. Obtain an order from medical direction to administer nitroglycerin. Um, I know in southeast Louisiana, your local protocols, um, are, they'll have a standing order to where you can uh, give nitro without calling medical direction. Check the, patient's, uh, check the medication to ensure that it is prescribed to the patient. It is proper medication and it is not expired. Please do not give expired medication to a patient even if it's theirs please 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 okay place the nitroglycerin blah, blah, blah. i'm going to get it out I promise place the nitro tablet under the patient's tongue and when we say we're going to give a patient the medication under the tongue we mean sublingually sublingually to administer nitroglycerin spray depress the container and deliver one spray under the tongue or sublingually Reassess blood pressure with two minutes of administering the nitroglycerin. Because you want to see if um, that vasodilator is working. Okay. Pediatric considerations for uh, uh, heart problems. Problems are usually due to congenital heart conditions, not acute coronary syndromes. It means the uh, child was born with a heart condition. Cardiac arrest is usually due to airway compromise or respiratory failure. Geriatric considerations. Geriatric patients represent the highest number of patients you treat who experience some form of acute coronary syndrome. Special considerations in geriatric cardiac events. 
um, History of Diabetes Mellitus. Um, you can read these. Okay. Um, learn these tables. Um, history of Trauma. History of Asthma. History of COPD. <clears throat> Assessment based approach for cardiac compromise and acute coronary syndrome. Consider the dispatch information. Um, Hopefully, when the caller called in, if they're having chest pains, they've told the dispatcher that. Um, but things can change. You know, they might call for something else, and then all of a sudden they're having chest pains. Nine times out of ten, people aren't going to call back and give an update. But be prepared. During your primary assessment, categorize as unresponsive slash cardiac arrest or responsive in minor, moderate, or severe distress. Begin CPR for cardiac arrest and apply the AED. For responsive patients, assess airway, breathing, circulation, and oxygenation. That means the SpO2. During your secondary, obtain the history. Use the OPQRST. OPQRST stands for onset, provocation, quality, radiation, severity, and time. And I'll give you the I'll give you some questions to ask for those. Ask about contraindications to fibrinolytic therapy. Anticipate that patients may downplay their symptoms. Yeah, I'm having chest pains, but it's not that bad. Well, then that's when you tell them, well, that's for the doctor to determine. We really need to get you, really need to get you to the hospital. Treat the following as cardiac compromise. Patient with angina lasting greater than 20 minutes. Recent onset of progressively worsening, worsening angina and nocturnal angina. Angina unrelieved by rest or three nitroglycerin tablets over 10 minutes. Chest discomfort lasting longer than 5 to 10 minutes after rest. Cardiac compromise and ACS, acute coronary syndrome. Consider atypical presentations. Not all symptoms have to be present for ACS to be present. Physical exam and baseline vitals. Look at the pupils, oral cavity, and their neck. Locations and radiations of chest discomfort associated with cardiac emergencies. Early signs of acute coronary syndrome or heart attack. We see the pain locations just under the sternum, mid chest, or the entire upper chest, mid chest, neck, and jaw, mid chest and the shoulder and inside the arms more frequently than the, in the left arm, upper abdomen often mistaken for indigestion, larger area of the chest. Uh, pulse, neck, jaw, and inside the arms, jaw from ear to ear in both sides of upper neck and in lower center neck, shoulder, usually left, and inside arm to the waist, plus opposite arm inside to the elbow, between the shoulder, uh, between the shoulder blades, so in the back. Physical exam and baseline vital signs. Examine the chest, please. Listen to the chest. Listen to the heart. Listen to the lungs. Lower and upper extremities, posterior body, and vital signs. We need to look around when you examine our patient. Please examine them. Signs and symptoms of cardiac compromise and ACS or chest discomfort or pain, which may radiate. And then epigastric pain, stomach. Sudden onset of sweating, cool, pale skin, difficulty breathing, lightheadedness, or dizziness. Signs and symptoms are anxiety or irritability, feeling of impending doom, abnormal pulse, nausea, or vomiting. Emergency medical care. We're going to provide reassurance and place the patient in a position of comfort. Apply oxygen according to the 2010 American Heart Association guidelines. We're going to assist the patient who has prescribed nitroglycerin. Administer aspirin according to the protocol. That's going to be 162 to 324 milligrams. Call for ALS backup and initiate early transport. In your reassessment, uh, patients with ACS can deteriorate to cardiac arrest, so we need to monitor them every three to five minutes. Closely reassess breathing and pulse. All right. Case study conclusion, as Lisa prepares the stretcher so that they can begin transport without delay, Ella assists Mr. Frey in taking an additional nitroglycerin tablet and 
According to protocol, it administers 325 milligrams of aspirin. It's going to be 324, not 325. In route, Ella reassesses Mr. Frey's pain level and vital signs. With a blood pressure of 128 over 80 and discomfort rated at 4 out of 10, Mr. Frey is a candidate for another dose of nitroglycerin. Ella advises the receiving hospital of Mr. Frey's condition. Upon arrival, a nurse performs a 12-lead EKG, and the physician begins his assessment and history. It is determined that Mr. Frey is having an acute myocardial infarction, and he is immediately prepared to receive fibrinolytic medications. Summary, your cardiovascular disease is a significant problem. Presentations can range from atypical, atypical symptoms to cardiac arrest. The time is of the utmost essence in treating acute coronary syndrome. For cardiac arrest, remember that the, remember the chain of survival when you had your uh, CPR class. Oxygen, nitroglycerin, and aspirin are drugs the EMT may use in the treatment of ACS. All right, we'll see you next time.